these sort of three foundational images for the novel in my mind for a really long time. And I suspected that they were going to be a novel. What, and what, what are those three foundational images? So they were, um, they were the building that, that became the, um, the, the sort of edifice of the Morningside. We, uh, we lived um, on Seminary Row in Manhattan for a really long time. And at the end of the block was the Jewish Seminary, um, which was this beautiful old building um, with actually an old complex. Um, and they sold part of the complex to a real estate developer, maybe three years before we left, three or four years before we left. And so the developer um, demolished those historic buildings and in their place put this massively tall, mon beautiful monstrosity of a tower, um, the tallest building in um, in the neighborhood. Uh, I think I think 32 or 33 stories. What, what um, neighborhood no, 37. was this? This was Morningside Heights. <laughs> Morningside Heights in Manhattan. <laughs> in Manhattan, yeah. Um, and I loved that. I loved that. Um, I, the, the morning side is not the name of the actual building, um, but I loved that that was the name of our neighborhood. I, like something about mornings, you know, it, was, um, it wasn't even the morning side, the morning side of Manhattan. We were on the west side. <laughs> That's the evening side. <laughs> right. um, <laughs> but, um, but I loved that word. And, and, and so, so the building, you know, watching this building um, sort of climb out of the rubble and like all the all the rats and the roaches that were released into the street as a result and like this this sort of and the, the neighborhood commission which was furious because it turned out that Morningside Heights you know the zoning still permitted a building that tall I mean there was a lot going on and um and then it was finished in like March or April of 2020 <laughs> <laughs> after everything you know um had shut down and there was there was something sort of um there was something fittingly um ironic about that a little bit of Schaden schadenfreude you know where i was like oh you, you really didn't displace these old buildings and like you made our lives hell for three years and like what did it get you yeah. um but it really got me thinking about abandoned places and the sort of the stubborn capitalist hope of these kinds of buildings and and sort of improvements and and um you know investments in the wake of of what is uh, sort of in the midst of what was going on not just in the pandemic but sort of in what is going on in in lots of urban spaces and lots of coastal spaces just this idea of like you know something is coming something bad like it's just climate change is real. It's happening. Uh, uh, you know, why are we building out Florida? Why are we, you know, why are we building luxury towers in Manhattan when like people can't, normal people who, 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 uh, who, you know, raise their kids there can't afford to live there. All, all this, you know, it was, it was sort of emblematic of that. So the building was one. The other thing. So that was the first, that was the first key image was this tower going up yeah. in your neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and then another key image, which had, I think preceded or, or had, had come, to, you know, which I had encountered um, at some point while the tower was being built was this little old lady in the neighborhood walking these three massive Rottweilers on a chain. Um, and they looked like Cerberus, you know, it looked like she was in like a chariot that was being pulled along by Cerberus. She was so small and like so frail looking and they were massive. You know, you see this and you're like, oh, this, if this goes wrong, like if they decide, if a cat shows up, this is just going to be a disaster. But there was something very powerful about her. And, and that really stayed with me, that image of her. It was, it was sunset, I remember. And she was sort of behind a chain link fence, walking them in, in some sort of a, apartment block. And I was like, wow. Um, so that was the other image. Sorry, and we should, I want to interject for listeners, uh, just so that everybody is up to speed. The first image of this tower factors into your novel because there is an apartment building that is central to the plot of your novel that is called the morning side. That's right. And then you have this uh, woman that you saw who was wa walking these Rottweilers who I guess prefigures the character in your novel named, and I'm going to, is it Bezzy Duras? It's Bezzy Duras. Yeah. Be Bezzy Duras. And she is a woman who lives in the morning side up in the penthouse and who walks on a nightly basis 
three, I believe, Irish wolfhounds. I think you changed the breed. I did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I wanted them to be sort of more willowy than 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 Rottweilers. They felt willowy in my mind, and I was like, okay. I love. Listen, I you know who has Irish wolfhounds is the author Pam Houston. Oh, really? Yeah, she lives up at altitude in Colorado on like a, a ranch. You know, she bought this property years ago, way up high, and she has always had Irish wolfhounds. And I'm obsessed. They're gigantic, but they're, they're beautiful they're dogs. Really, they're shocking. There's a couple of them around town. I think there are two families that own two two pairs of wolfhounds in town. And whenever we run into them, it's just like everybody sort of steps back. It's like Falcor has come out of the, the never ending story and is like walking down the street. You're just so who, and I mean wait, who has a who has an Irish wolfhound in Manhattan? I mean, for God's sake. You... Oh, I live in Wyoming. Oh okay. I live in Wyoming now. So 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 but but it's and that's sort of a vaguely fitting place to 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 have um to have wolfhounds, but at the same time they kind of they kind of look like they belong only in Ireland. You know, they, they don't look of this time at all. They have this like wiry hair and these like wire, you know, these big wiry eyebrows and they look like, you know, they look like they're seeing into your soul. They really do more so than most dogs. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like maybe they belong in like Middle Earth or something, you know? Totally. Totally. You know, it's an old breed. Um, so yeah, so these, these, these images had sort of, what was number three? You had the building, you had the woman walking the three dogs, and then what was the third image? Oh, and the third image was was just um, our street, our street uh, on a particular night uh, uh, with where for some reason the lights had sort of malfunctioned, and then there was one street lamp at the very very end, and it was just kind of a like it was just like darkness, but also because I knew the street so well, it wasn't um, fear inducing at all. There was just something about the comfort of that darkness that it was a feeling tied to the image. Um, and I had felt for a long time that, you know, I had, I'd moved around all my life. Uh, I've lived, I lived in New York for eight years, which is the longest I've lived anywhere. Um, and when we left um, to come here. Uh, which is what Jackson, Wyoming. This is Jackson, Wyoming. Yeah. Um, we had been splitting time for a while, and then during the pandemic, we came here to sort of prepare for our eventual move to, to Texas, um, where I was going to teach at the at, at uh, Texas State San Marcos for for two years. So there was sort of there was already this plan to leave. Then we we you know we left in a hurry, and I started to I started to long for New York, and I started to feel like maybe this disconnect that I had felt from, from the city was false. And like, actually my knowledge of it existed in those moments, right? The things that are most granular and closest to you, the things that exist in your neighborhood, you know, that don't feel like these big moments in the history of Manhattan, right? Which everyone is telling you, you missed. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but, that you know these little tiny details that exist only in your mind are central to forming that memory of the city and so that was sort of with me when and i i knew that i was going to try to shape it into a novel at some point and then they they asked me to write something for the decameron project and i was like well here's my chance to to see what this is, right? Well, like and, if, and what is the Decameron project? The Decameron project was, um, uh, the, the Decameron is a uh, plague era Italian text um, about people <laughs> about people hiding out from the plague. And so the New York Times uh, did a pan COVID pandemic time Decameron project where they asked uh, writers sort of all over the States to write their pandemic story and it didn't necessarily have to be about the pandemic but it did have to be of the pandemic right the idea was that like this storytelling is is a is is a snapshot of the moment and it's also something to help to help get us all through and so i wrote this story i started to write this story and i was like if this if there is something here for the novel i'll be able to shape it into a short story first i wanted to give myself that sort of impetus to start because I was dragging my heels. And, um, and the first thing that happened was I had this image of uh, a young girl and her mom walking home. I think it was from a bakery in the short story um, to this building. And only a couple of the lights were on in the, 
in the whole, you know, up, up the whole side of it. And, um, and, and it went from there. Um, and, and immediately in the story, there was Bezzy Duraz and her dogs and this building. Um, so that's where it, that's where it started. Um, it was all this sort of swirling, um, you know, pandemic, uh, induced haze and, it felt very, and then I, and then I kind of dawdled with it for a long time. When I, when the short story was finished, I finished it in like, I think three days. And then I, I kind of messed with it and was like, okay, but like, what's the, you know, sort of, was sort of trying to explore it and world build a little bit in my mind and a little bit on, on paper. And then the whole plot came to me maybe three months later and I wrote it frantically. I wrote the first draft very, very quickly um, over the course of, I don't know, maybe three weeks, maybe a month. So wait, um, so wait, when you say the whole plot came to you, can you just drill down into that a little bit more? Like, what was that process like? I, I was able to latch on to certain events that felt true to the course of the book before I was able to latch on to the characters. So I knew there was still in her mother, th this aunt, Anna, who wasn't in the short story, suddenly appeared um, and then disappeared. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how much to reveal. Um, and then the, uh, placing the mother in, in the position of superintendent. Um, so, and then and just so I, mean, I just want to interject for people who have not had a chance to read, you have the protagonist of this book is a young girl named Sylvia, who is 11 years old, I believe. That's right. And she and her mother are displaced people. They're immigrants. They're coming from what I believe they refer to as back home in That's the novel. Right. And they have come to Island City, which is, I think, uh, approximately Manhattan. Uh, yeah, sure. Yes. Yeah. Possibly yeah. based on possibly. loosely yeah. based upon, loosely but it based is on. in feel. Is, yeah, it, and this is a dystopian climate future, where Island City is half submerged under the under the rising sea. It is a former metropolis that is now besieged by water, and yet they're trying to repopulate it. There's a That's even right. like a, a bureaucratic entity called what the Repopulation Committee. The repopulation program is the is the program, yeah. But it's the uh, the posterity initiative is the is the is the bureaucratic committee, and then they have a part of one of their mandates is the repopulation program, where they try to sort of bring people to live in the most decimated parts of the country, which tend to be urban because they tend to be sort of old ports and um, coastal and coastal. Yeah. So okay, so that's just the. I just want to give people sort of like a foundation. For the story it takes place in the future this is what you would call climate fiction it's also dystopian i guess climate fiction is inherently dystopian it's kind of a it <laughs> i mean it's kind of ya it's kind of like uh literary fiction it's a blend i feel like of different things and yeah sorry go ahead well i was going to say can you just talk i mean it'd be interesting to hear you talk about that like how intentional that was or how much of that maybe just emerged in the writing and kind of. I, I, I think a lot of the, um, the, I, there was nothing intentional about this book. It all just sort of came, it all just sort of came out. Um, I think I've never, I've never approached a project knowing less about it than I did this project. So lots of, aspects of it came as a surprise to me and were sort of just like inherent to the to the viewpoint of Syl. It's told in the first person from Syl's point of view. I I dislike writing in the first person so intensely and yet I have done it for all three of my books. <laughs> and every time I start again, I'm like, so oh, no more first person. And then inevitably, you know, the way the inf the way the rate of revelation emerges um forces me into into the first person. But um she's young, she's 11. I wanted to it felt necessary from the beginning to follow a protagonist who couldn't, who didn't have any context for the things that were going on around her and who was trying to make sense of it. And I think that that's something that, that happens to, to immigrant people of, of all ages, but this is, 
that I wanted to write a protagonist who was in the thrall of an authority figure. And that authority figure, in this case, Syl's mom, had prevented her, had, had sort of shortened her horizon even more. Because Syl's mother is very reticent to talk about back home. She's a woman who lives in the moment. She's very practical and very handy. Um, and But she doesn't bother with the past. And so Syl her childhood before they arrive at the at the morning side is sort of made up of these in in the moment situations where it's like well now we live here and now we live here and this is life and when she arrives to island city um which as you say is 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 half submerged and and sort of mysterious anyway because of its size because of how depopulated it is because of the bureaucracy that's brought them in um her aunt is there and her aunt is actually an open book. She's really, really eager to talk about the past. She's very nostalgic for it. Um, she is somebody who lives by and through folklore. And so this too kind of um, centered Syl as a young protagonist because I wanted to follow someone who was grappling with belief um, and trying to make sense of the world through new information that was not reliable, but was very emotionally enticing for her. Um, and, and by uh, that, you mean the folklore that her aunt Ana is espousing and mm -hmm. that kind of like magical realism, that kind of magical view of reality. Yeah. And this is not new to your work, the integration of folklore. And I want to say, like like uh, Bessie Dura, if I'm again pronouncing that correctly, this woman who lives in the penthouse in the Morningside in this in this apartment tower, is also from back home, and is a mysterious figure, uh, an artist of some accomplishment, has these three big dogs, and Aunt Ina believes that the dogs shape shift. That's like, right into men when they are not in. The streets like they when they're in the apartment they become men according to her and of course sill latches onto this and begins to wonder and there is a term used to describe bezi dura and it is the villa that's right uh, and a villa is I, I i i did some wikipedia on this just so <laughs> you know <laughs> i have skills but uh it's a uh character in what serbian folklore slavic sort of general slavic um, folklore. Yeah. She's a, she's a, a nymph of woods and mountains. Um, but not an, she's often described as being either very, very small. The villa is either very small or enormous, sort of like the mountain itself. Um, and she, in her role in folklore is usually, um, is <laughs> actually very sort of climate change forward. She's, um, she is looking to be left alone. Human encroachment forces an interaction. And she is, um, she becomes a vengeful spirit, a spiteful spirit. And so in, in different manifestations of her stories, she's often tricking someone into giving up something. Sometimes it's a, um, a firstborn child. Sometimes it's, um, a woman that she demands to be uh, uh, sacrificed in in uh, and entombed in a structure that she is preventing from being built until the sacrifice is made, and that's the story. That version of the story is the one that Anna tells Sil, um, the uh, the entombment narrative. Okay, and so how do you like? You're aware of this prior to sitting down to write this book, and then you integrate it, or is it something that you stumbled into, or? We're thinking of as you did research or got deeper into the weeds, uh, into these characters. I've been thinking about the Vila for a really long time. For, I would say, upwards of a decade as as an entity that I really wanted to write about. I, um, I wrote one of my... The first book that I wrote after The Tiger's Wife, which went in the drawer, featured her as a as a character, and um, I didn't have I didn't have the the mechanisms then as a writer to to, to sort of put together the the things that I thought belonged in that novel. It was a mess, um, and it was the it was the first thing that I really put away. Um, but she followed me around since then, and um, 
Syl's obsession with the neighbor, Bessie Dara, um, and and sort of with these three dogs and like whether or not they were men, um, that led to my realization as well as her own that this was the place for that character to, to actually come out for that, for, for the, for dealing with that particular folklore to emerge. Hmm. Well, there's, and I want to get, I want to actually talk more about that, uh, in just a bit, but before I do, I just want to give listeners maybe a bit of a fuller sense of the world that you are depicting in this novel, because any kind of futuristic fiction, whether it's climate fiction or it's some sort of sci-fi, there's a level of sophistication to the imaginative process that has to unfold in order for there to be like certain consistencies. Sure. And to make sure that the world is dimensional and believable to the reader and that people aren't thinking to themselves, well, wait, that couldn't be, or, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways I, I can imagine you would trip up if you're trying to portray on the page, uh, a believable and kind of cohesive future world. So Island city, I don't even know. I don't know if the year was ever articulated. It's not. It's not. So it's at some indeterminate, undetermined moment or time in the future, but just to give people an idea. Uh, there's strict food rationing happening in the world as you depict it. There's no meat. Uh, that's kind of like a rule. You can't eat meat because, you know, there's what impacts on the climate and maybe limitations on supply or whatever. And uh, there's also maybe the part of it that like haunted me the most was, and I, you know, I will just say spoiler alert. This is a bit of a spoiler, but Syl's mother takes a job as a diver what's the official job title what is it like she's a, she's a, a a salvage diver salvage diver. wreck diver yeah so i'm ima- i mean you can imagine an uh, an island metropolis besieged by water and salvage diving is actually one of the more lucrative professions like well compensated professions it's dangerous work but people you know learn how to dive they go down underwater and try to recover submerged valuables to investigate the structural integrity, I think of buildings that might be eroding. And so I don't know, that was like a really deft imaginative move. I was like, Oh yeah, that probably will happen. And also that would be really scary and dangerous and creepy to be like scuba diving, you know, underwater at like the, at the lower levels of these skyscrapers and all this kind of stuff. So I don't know. I just like, would love to hear you talk about, you say you wrote this in a rush. Like I I have to believe that means that a lot of the world that you depict in this book came to you in a rush, but there's so much that would have to arrive. Like it just feels really comprehensive and a big challenge creatively. Was it? I really, I really appreciate you, you saying that. Um, And I'm, I'm very, I'm very gratified to hear it. Thank you. I, it, it was, I think the plot, the plot elements came in a rush. Like, like in that, in that moment where I saw it all, I, I, I saw, I saw Syl's mom salvage diving. Right. And I was like, okay, well, how does that work? You know, like I knew, I knew that what happens as a result of her taking that job was going to happen. And then in the second draft, which I wrote while, <laughs> while pregnant, just sort of like, you know, <laughs> like half asleep and then, oh, right. Um, and these moments of like intense sleepiness, but then intense clarity as well. Um, I, I, I was like, well, how does, how does that work? And I think a, a couple of things, a couple of things went into it. One was that I wanted, I wanted to understand the bones of this world. I, I didn't want, I didn't want this to be dystopian post-apocalyptic fic, post-apocalyptic fiction after one event. I wanted it to be a slow slide um, that is precipitated by people not doing enough or uh, uh, doing, you know, or bureaucratic movements being made too late to make a difference. And everybody just sort of trying to hold on 
to things as they were and like maybe having having let things go here or there but sort of planning that things are going to go back to the way they were before this calamity right like trying to repopulate the city and 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 keep it from becoming abandoned um you know rationing food rather than the, you know to keep people there rather than than sending them to a place where food might be more available um digging for 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 scraps of the past in this like very dangerous way it felt ex- accessible to me from this point where we are as a society now like it felt true to the way we are it was just like well let's just you know let's just build that house in that swamp I'm sure it'll be fine for the next 10 years, you know, and then that's a problem for future us. Right. Um, and, and so I wanted to write about, about like future us, the problem has arrived. It's like, it's a, it's a drag into it, but it isn't, you know, a single bomb or a single sort of um, event. So, and then it helped that Syl was so young because <laughs> well, for for two reasons, because because so much of the circumstances of of her world are um, illegible to her as a young person and as an immigrant, and then they're also illegible to her because they're failing, right? Like these these systems that are in place, like rations are in place, but they don't really work. People aren't are nobody eats meat except for the people who do, you right. know, and and. <laughs> Um, and, and so I, I wanted it to be messy and kind of, kind of inscrutable. And it, and so I worked out the details of how this might look in the second draft, the pregnancy draft, I worked out how this would work if it worked. And then I took away the functionality (laughs) and was like, well, it isn't working. And she doesn't really understand it. And, and I hoped that because I do think that sometimes, I mean, there are minds who work, there are people who write true dystopian fiction who work out every detail and it is necessary for their narratives that every detail is revealed to the reader and that the reader understand it and be able to follow along. And I don't understand this society, you know what I mean? Like, it's just a mess of contradictions. I, I barely understand what's going on. You know, it, it's tax season. I don't, I don't know what's going on. So, so <laughs> Um, so I, I, that I think inscrutability served me well in, in being able, when I decided to start taking elements of explanation out, because I didn't want the reader to feel like they, they understood it completely because still didn't, um, and it wasn't working. Um, so, so I, I liked taking that imaginative jump into, okay, like what are the rules of this society? It was very enjoyable and I, and I got to sort of linger there and, and revising is my favorite, my favorite part of writing. Anyway, I really intensely dislike the generative phase. It's bumbling around in the dark a lot. <laughs> um, but then as I revised, things started to, to make sense on a human level, on a societal level, but not on a granular level. And that's where, where Sill's youth also became useful. Well, I think like there's a, a, useful takeaway for people out there who are writers and who might be working in this vein that I don't care. I don't care what kind of book you're writing into a dystopian future. You know, some might be more granular and detailed than others, but you're never going to get it all. Right. And you don't need to. I think that's the lesson, you know, cause I, I never doubted the world that you built. Like I, I felt like f- I felt firmly oriented in it despite the fact that there were not every single card was face up on the table. Do you know what I'm saying? Like you had your, your particular flourishes and details and visual cues and like little details that signified governmental bureaucracy or governmental dysfunction, but you didn't have to give a ton of expository information every step of the way to keep me locked in. Like that's kind of a relief as a writer to, to know, like it's, it's not incumbent upon you to spell it all out. And in fact, if you did try to spell it all out, I could imagine how that could encumber the narrative and could make it slow down in a way that's dissatisfying to the reader. I agree. And I, first of all, I I can't tell you how, how 
gratifying that is to hear and how much that means to me because it was one of the one of the concerns that I most had you know uh, grappling with the different drafts of like will this be enough um but I do I tell my students um I teach in in at the MFA in Bennington right now and I've taught it at other places before and and you know you can always you have to know the information as the writer. You don't have to share it with the reader when it comes to world building. You have to know it because you have you do have to be able to sort of slip it in 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 different appropriate moments, right? Like like here's here's a place where like that knowledge actually serves the the, the narrative and, and moves the story forward. And like if you don't have it, that 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 absence will be felt. I always know when I'm reading other people's work, and I always know when I'm reading my own, like the writer doesn't know the answer to this, right? And if they do, that's often enough uh, to to create that feeling in the narrative um, and and move things along. And the reader doesn't necessarily have to be in on the information; they just have to be in on the feeling. And and I I I, I I'm really thank you thank you for saying what you said. Yeah, no, I think that like, just as a uh, a person who's kind of like digging into this book and trying to sort of like in the early stages of reading any book, you're sort of trying to decode it, right? It's kind of teaching mm -hmm. you how to read it, especially maybe with dystopian fiction or futuristic fiction. You sort of have to get get your bearings a little bit more than you normally would. And this visual of an island metropolis, a, like largely abandoned and besieged by water is like haunting and also kind of hauntingly beautiful, but also you do a good job of underlining ways in which it might be repellent and even gross, <laughs> like some of the smells and you know what I'm saying? Some of the things that would happen if you had like a city half submerged underwater, like there's gonna be consequences uh, that are not necessarily savory. For sure. Um, but I don't know, <laughs> just like it's a big challenge you gave yourself and you talk about the point of view character, the protagonist, Syl, this 11 year old girl, and how seeing this world and this place depicted through her eyes and through her limited understanding of what's going on, both as a young person, but also like you say, as an immigrant who is new to this place and is trying to decode it anyway. This is an experience that you yourself have lived, correct? Like you are drawing, I'm imagining on your childhood. I think you immigrated at the age of five, was it? Did I... We left when I was seven. We we uh, we left the former Yugoslavia when I was seven years old, and then we came to the states when I was twelve. And in between, we lived in Cyprus and in Egypt, in Cairo. In, in Cairo. So I mean, this is. You, I mean, those are some disparate locations. Like going from Cairo, <laughs> Cyprus to Cairo to the United States. You've really, as a young person, got to experience a lot, and had to learn new places and that's not necessarily that's not easy and it can be confusing but it's also in a, a lot of ways a great education i really i i, I agree i i had a i had a I, I loved many parts of my childhood. I particularly loved living in, in, in Egypt. Um, I had a very loving family. I was an only child until I was 15 years old. My brother was born here in the States. Um, and I think that as I've gotten older, <laughs> um, I was always pretty adept with the languages. So I learned English when we, when we left the former Yugoslavia, Serbo-Croatian was my first language. Um, I learned English in Cyprus when, when I went to um, British school and I also went to British school in Cairo. And then we, then we moved here and it was like, well, this is American English. This is a different kind of English, but um, that, that sort of pivoting, that, that necessity to pivot in, I think, immigrant families um, and then the necessity to seek legibility, cultural legibility, and and understand what's going on around you, in order to assimilate, usually, right? Like in order to be as as invisible as possible, um, which for some people is much easier than for others. You know, like my my family, my mom and I, 
when we came over, we were blonde and we spoke English. And the rest of my family who had come over directly from Mostar and from Sarajevo, uh, um, they they were not. You know, they 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 coded very foreign, and um, their you know English was completely new to them, and so their experience of that legibility was very, very different than ours. Um, but it is something that, that no matter your experience, you're always sort of trying to, you're, you're, you're trying to see how to fit in as fast as possible. <laughs> Um, and that's not just when you, you know, when you come to the States, when we went to, when we went to Cairo, it was like, well, like we live here now on this street. Like, like the, the, this is, this is the neighborhood, you know, this is the, the neighborhood store. Um, that's the neighborhood, you know, fruit cart, like, like, you know, get in and start learning Arabic. Right. Um, <laughs> Did you learn Arabic? I had some, my mother, who's a whiz with languages, had it in like three months. She's remarkable, like truly. Um, but I, and I had some and then like immediately forgot it. I had a very hard time with, um, with Arabic literacy. Like I, I'm a very visual learner and I couldn't make sense of the script. Like it just didn't, it wouldn't stick. And so the language like went the minute, the minute I stopped looking at the script. Um, but, but um, yeah, so, so my experience was one of, 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 of a lot of movement and a lot of change um, and a lot of learning on, 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 on the fly, you know, all, all the places we lived had, uh, huge oral storytelling cultures um the storytelling culture in egypt like like con contemporary recent past and then the distant ancient past like all all of it was just so you know so intriguing and and i yeah i loved it and um i think a lot of that curiosity and kind of like well let's just go with this um ended up in in sil which was was not intentional. I think that I think the sort of more emotionally and psychologically autobiographical elements of this novel really snuck up on me. Well, you know, just I, like, well, of course she doesn't know what's going on. It's like, well, I didn't either. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I mean, and this is another component to the novel that I think we need to underscore, which is that not only is Syl trying to decode life in Island City and life in the morning side and all that that entails, but there is also a backstory to her life and a narrative in this place that is referred to as back home that is uh, alluded to and is described in bits and pieces as being like very troubled. Like they're fleeing something unpleasant and violent. Yeah. And there's a lot of dystopian aspects to back home and to the places that they have been in the past. And I think that that squares with your experience as an immigrant moving out of the former Yugoslavia. I'm imagining it has to do with the unrest there. Is that right? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, we left, we left as the war was beginning. Um, people in our household, I mean, my, my grandparents and my mother raised me and they had all been wary of it kicking off for a long time so so my my childhood memories of belgrade where i where i was born where i where i grew up um until the age of seven were fraught with this kind of energy of of something coming right and i actually i also think that this is one of the re <laughs> this is one of the reasons why this made its way into my pandemic novel been thinking about it a lot and, and how their displacement um, and their heartbreak about it and all their sort of the, the psychological trauma of, of losing your nation and not just being forced away from it, but, but materially losing your nation. They were Yugoslavs proper. We were an ethnically mixed family through and through all of us. Um, my grandfather was uh, a Roman Catholic Slovene who, you know, practiced here and there my grandmother was a bosniak muslim like like my mom was born in sarajevo you know a proud child of of, of socialist yugoslavia <laughs> you know and um and they they believed in yugoslavia they believed that this this unity was greater than the disparate ethno-nationalist forces that were threatening to tear it apart and when that didn't come to pass when it didn't survive they were Dis each destroyed in their own different ways emotionally, you know, and because it was ge that generation, they didn't talk about it. They just sort of 
was you know like it exploded and they like just drank just, yeah exactly it's just like I'm sorry. no they didn't even drink which oh. is you know um, um which now as an older person i'm like wow <laughs> <laughs> um but but um you know i grew up with this sense that something was coming that something big was coming because big big things came in cycles, right? Like this, this idea of like, you have to be ready for something. You have to be ready for something. And then the, then the pandemic happened and I was like, oh, I'm ready. Like, here it is. <laughs> um, of course I didn't react, <laughs> but, but, but it felt, it felt like the culmination of, of like a, of that kind of loop of that kind of cycle where it was like, oh, here it is. Here's the thing. And like, it's a rival reset, some sort of internal clock for me. And so I'm I'm not surprised now when I when I think about it sort of from the from the bird's eye view of no longer being in the process of writing the book I'm not surprised that the pandemic you know led to a book that was so um, deeply engaged with these very specific childhood elements. Um, because of course, you know, because of course, <laughs> um, and, and, uh, yeah, so, so that's, um, I, I had set out to answer a different question, but now I answered that one. Now well, I made up this, <laughs> this answer for no, a question you didn't ask. I mean, I think it, I think that it, uh, I think that it is an extension of the answer to the question that I had asked. And I think that it makes sense to me that your experiences as a young immigrant and this sense, it's interesting to me that as a young person, you said you, you know, you left the former Yugoslavia at age seven and you had grown up with this sense of kind of foreboding that something you were aware, even at that age, that there was a rising tension and that something big might happen. And then boom, age seven, you leave country and suddenly you're in Cyprus or suddenly you're in Cairo for a young child that, that that's disruptive. And I think kids often handle things better than adults. Maybe you were fine. <laughs> you know, like sometimes I think there's a resourcefulness to children. But the point that I want to make is that if we're going to think of life as like, and if we're going to think of maybe history as like a series of loops, it's like a spiral rather than a linear progression, right? Yeah. To then find yourself in 2020 in Manhattan and suddenly everything is shutting down and ambulances are wailing at all hours taking people to the hospital with COVID and there's this kind of global crisis unfolding. This is something that you had lived before. So there was maybe a recognition or a preparedness that other people might not have had so acutely. Is that what you're saying? I think so. It felt very familiar and there was a, and there was a strange kind of relaxing of the brain and that familiarity because I was like, well, this is, this is the thing we've been waiting for. And, and I'm ready. Like we're ready for this. Well, but and, it's also, it's also, I mean, we got to say like to put things in historical context, March, 2020, when lockdown began, which we're now four years. I mean, it's almost four years to the day. Crazy. Yeah. A lot of yeah. time has gone by, but uh, you know, that was also in an election year. That That's was right. also after four years of Donald Trump. That's right. And, you know, there was, I think, an, a dystopian feel, at least from my perspective, anyway. Yeah. And then you throw a worldwide pandemic on top of it and a complete shutdown of society. <laughs> it's like, it was a lot. It was a yeah. lot. I think we're all still processing it. I think when you're in it, what are you going to do? You just live through it and you kind of just do what you can. But that was wild history to live through. It really was. And I think that the part of what made it so it made made it feel so horrific then and 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 continues to make it so horrific to think about now you know it, it, is that it's beginning to feel like the things that are happening have no precedent like of course they do but um but it was it was the first time in my adult life, for instance, that I was like, I recognize this, I recognize what is happening, but I don't know what's going to happen next, right? And and I think a lot of people felt that way, on, you know, in November of, of twenty sixteen. Like that was that was a really I, that was a that was a tough time because it was like here's here is this 
terrifying scenario. Um, a person who was all ego um, has just taken the reins of the most powerful country on earth. Like who knows what's going to happen. Right. And, and um, I think that, that, that feeling of like, I don't, I don't, I can't read, like, I can't look at the past and like read the tea leaves and be like, this will, this, this is what will happen next. And in the few places where I can, it's not good. You know, it wasn't good in 2016. It wasn't good for the, during the pandemic and it doesn't, and it feels not good right now, you know, as we head into another election. (laughs) There is that feeling of something's coming or like something's got to give, maybe it could give in a good way. I tend to have a little bit of optimism just because, it might be self-protective. I just have to. <laughs> I can't live totally in the darkness, but it does feel like there is an inflection point that we are at again. And there is just, there's, there has to be big change and there have to be, like, we have to beat back this darkness that yeah. is encroaching. Otherwise it's going to be bad for everybody. Even the people who support the darkness, I think don't realize the degree to which it will, um, hinder them as well and be bad for them as well. Yeah. But I was reading something and maybe it was in prep for this conversation. This could be something you said. This could be something totally unrelated. My mind is a jumble of things that I have read, (laughs) but it had to do with being a parent in the modern age and the quandary that parents find themselves in right now in terms of trying to advise their kids on the future like, like for something as practical as like professions to pursue, uh, but also just like trying to prepare your kid for the future isn't as easy as it used to be. Like there was, I think a time in my lifetime where you would just be like, yeah, you get your degree and you go out and you pursue what you're passionate about and things will fall into place. (laughs) Yeah. And uh, like kids today, like I look at my kids and I'm like, I feel a little bit tongue tied. And I, I know that you wrote this book during pregnancy and then after your, your child was born, yeah. clearly like the 11 year old protagonist at large in an abandoned city that is half submerged underwater probably has something to do with the fact of your motherhood, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't want to read too much into it, but it seems. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't say you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, like it came from within. Yeah. I, 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 I think so. And I, and, you know, I, I wrote the, 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 the third draft after my daughter was born, like the sort of the final me- metabolizing of all of it happened. And I, I change a lot from draft to draft. I have a tendency to rewrite a lot. So like every draft is, is essentially, the essence is the same. But the material is different. Um, yeah, I think, you know, the two things happened. One was <laughs> I immediately became a lot kinder to Sill's mom. Immediately, like, I became a mother myself. And it was like, mothers are great. They're <laughs> sainted. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so that was an immediate revision. And, um, you know, sort of a prayer. And, 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 then, and then I think, you know, one of the things, the final third of the book um a lot of things changed throughout the book and a lot of things reshuffled and like ended up in different, you know, thirds. And, um, but the final third of the book stayed chronologically exactly as, as, as it was. And then I was finally able to finish, finish it, like write the ending after my daughter was born. And, um, and and there's you know there's sort of a moment of reckoning between Syl and, and and her mother where and I don't know if you've had this experience too with sort of older people in your family, um, perhaps parents. This is something I've been talking with with friends about a lot. It's like it's, at some point you hit an age and and all that stuff that like older people would never say to you. It's just like a key has been you know like like the door's been unlocked and they're like here's the truth of what was happening then and like here's how I really felt about that and oh these two people had an affair you didn't know you know there's just like it just starts coming out and you're like oh my god like I, <laughs> I had some questions I didn't have questions about all of this you know um so <laughs> um. So Syl and her mom have a have a moment of reckoning that sort of happens. Like Syl's mom just hits one of these moments and starts talking, and she, you know, she she tells her something that I that I I have since realized I've, I've come to believe. You know, it, it's a 
that I myself believe that, that, that it is impossible that when, you know, you, you don't, perhaps previous generations had faith that the templates by which they lived their own lives could serve as templates for their offspring, right? Like, 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 like which is, you get your degree, you get a job, you, you seek out stability, but stability itself, which is something that, you know, again, like immigrants often move for, for that, for, you know, for this, for the, 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 the promise of, stability not necessarily not necessarily wealth you know just just i can predict what is going to happen more easily in this society that ability is eroding all the time with like advents in technology the things that we value in society the the, the shifts that we're making as um you know as as we kind of welcome fascism back in like all these different ways and 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 a, all over all of it is climate change, right? Like the fact that like species are disappearing, ways of life are disappearing. They're they're gone, you know. They're gone. <laughs> and um, so I think it's a time of profound grief. It's very difficult to 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 admit to your kid, you know. I grieve for what you won't have, but you won't have it, right? Like my job is to prepare you, and like I have to. I have to tell you, you're not going to have it. I don't know what you're going to have, but I know what you won't have. That I think, and I think that that's becoming more and more the case, given the world that we're in. And I, I, I yeah, I think it's ter- I mean, it's terrifying and 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 deeply sad in many ways. Maybe they'll have other wonderful things. Maybe they'll go to space. You know, I don't <laughs> like. There's all kinds of ways we can be saved, but um. A lot of a lot of what was there before can't be counted on anymore, even here. And and I think that's a big shock. I think there's this. I mean, I don't want to get too touchy feely, but it feels like a spiritual crisis, like a yeah. like a hu- humanity, like that's the inflection point. Like we're either going to evolve, like a, in a species wide way, at least you know, or in a large way in the species in a more like healthful and sane direction or it feels like we're going to perish. Yeah. Like, I don't want to get too gloom and doom, but that's seems like that that's what the stakes are. And I have, to, if I'm being honest, I'm hopeful that we can get it together, but I don't see like, like huge overt evidence of it. <laughs> I'm waiting. Maybe it's happening. Maybe it's happening in each of us individually in subtle ways. And, these shifts are sort of hard to detect in real time, kind of similar to the way that the rising tide of, you know, the rising waters of climate change are hard to detect on a second by second basis, but over longer periods of time, suddenly half the city's underwater, you know, yeah, maybe the shifts that we need to see are in motion and the effect, like the positive impacts of those shifts will be felt. Like, how does it work? It's like, it's like, it feels like nothing's happening, but then it happens all at once kind of thing, you know, maybe that's. And those, I think historically that has been the case in inflection points and in, in, in different, yeah, a, a different inflection points in history, you know, all of a sudden it's like, well, we're not going to be a feudal system anymore. <laughs> you know, the divine right of Kings. Nope. Yep, and, over. and, <laughs> you know, I bet people felt a lot of existential dread, like when they were, they probably didn't have the vocabulary for it, you know, sitting in the mud in their hovels um in in their fiefdoms but like they could feel it (laughs) um and and i i wonder you know i do think i think it's heartening to see how angry the youth are they're really mad and they should be and that anger i think can translate into a rejection of the past, you know, in, into a cleaning of the slate, what the practical uh, mechanisms for that are, I really don't know. I, you know, the sort of our, our capitalist overlords feel really, really powerful. And like, I don't know, you know, I don't know how one rejects the systems that are, that are allowing all this to sort of slow slide into, into doom. Well, but. I, I, I have <laughs> thoughts on this because I wrestle with it. I, I feel that anger too. 
Yeah. Uh, and I think it's a righteous anger in most respects or many respects. I think that anger, like righteous anger is good to me. Like I think there's positive outcomes to be found in righteous anger as a fuel for like proactive resistance and behaviors. I think the other kinds of anger, anger that seeks like vengeance, <laughs> anger that that's a blind emotion in my experience of it. And it, things that I say and do when I'm under its sway are never positive. Uh, it's always like a, Ooh, I wish I would have kept my shit together. You know, I'd never like as good as it might feel, you know, in the moment yeah. to sort of lash out or to feel right. And to, you know, all that kind of stuff never works out. So I have kind of like a two sided mind when it comes to that. I think that when I feel that anger and I listen to it, or I watch TikTok videos of young people like ranting, <laughs> some of some of whom are incredibly eloquent and even funny and, you know, sort of shockingly well-informed. Uh, I can find myself both impressed, but also I can feel like, okay, big changes need to happen and they need to happen pretty quickly. Fast. Yeah. And I think there can be a hunger in young people for like full-scale revolution, <laughs> <laughs> even violent revolution. You know, you can feel people like, fuck this, we're going to tear, <laughs> you know, we're going to tear it down. <laughs> I think maybe if I were younger and I were childless, I might be more on board with that. I think when yeah. you have a, once you have a kid or maybe once you've lived through a violent revolution, it doesn't always turn out well. Yeah. Uh, you know, I just talked to yeah. Katya Apakina. She wrote a book that's about the Russian revolution in part at least. And it's like, yeah, the revolution happened and the czar was toppled. And then what took its place wasn't better. Right. And in some ways it was worse and it got like, you know, it was still messy and there's still like lynchings and, you know, bad behavior. So I think I, I kind of like want to pump the brakes and be like, I don't, you know, we need big change and we need it fast, but can't we do it within like democratic systems and institutions that are already in place and which are very difficult to build? Right. I, I certainly hope so. Yeah. But do you see yeah. what I'm saying? Like, that's the quandary for me is like, Totally. How do these big and necessary changes happen in a way that isn't like net negative or doesn't lead to even further destruction? Like it can sound good to like storm the Bastille or whatever. And like, <laughs> but I, I think sometimes people might be like seeing it through rose colored glasses in terms of how it might actually play out. Oh, for sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and I mean, and we, you know, it, it uh, 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 <laughs> what happens if the wrong, you know, like the wrong crowd storms the Bastille or right. the Capitol, you know, and it's, 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 um, and, and I think, you know, to your point, I think if they're storming, it's always the wrong crowd. <laughs> well, and I, but also, I mean, not necessarily, I mean, it's maybe, but yeah. it's like power vacuums are what yeah. scare me Yeah, because power vacuums seem like a dangerous circumstance because people who are drawn to power, like who are like, yeah, give me the power. <laughs> Probably the last people in the world you want to have the power. It's Absolutely. like, a, it's a conundrum. You really need like good faith, public servants, people who truly take a selfless approach to public service to get into that line of work. That's what I think we need. We need better politicians. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly. Like it, 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 the job itself has to be one that is honorable. Like maybe it's it's this sort of rethinking of what it means to have that power within the society that it is really to serve, right? Not to that it's just you know, for lack of a better way to put it, that it's a spiritual mandate that you are that that part of your democratic duty when you are elected is to be a servant of the people and 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 not you know out for yourself like like not somebody who you know like like i wouldn't give the job to anybody who wanted it you know well yeah and, and that's the thing like the 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 job itself the the jobs within politics they have become so corrupted and the, the maybe the maybe the real revolution is like that power means something different that's right and that to assume it means something different 
That's that. right. And, and that, you know, it sounds like we're way off topic, but we're really not. We're really because, not. <laughs> because I think that these concerns are at the heart of your climate fiction and your dystopian novel. You know, it's like you're clearly thinking about all this stuff subsurface, I think, which is, I think, an apt way to put it, considering half of Island City is underwater, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but this yeah. is this is the undertow of your book, right? This is what I think is fueling it, coupled with maybe motherhood and the pandemic and the election and all of it. I mean, it's, see, I can understand how this book would be born in the time and place that it was born. <laughs> yeah, I it is it is it is definitely a product of its time in the society and in my life, you know, in my in my in my life as a person of the society and in my life as a person changing roles for nice. sure. <laughs> well, I want to uh shift gears a little bit and I want to talk to you about your career. Okay. Because you kind of came right out of the gates as a very young person and had huge success in publishing you i want to say published the tiger's wife you might have even sold it when you were 24 23 you were young it was young yeah and it goes on to be a national book award finalist it wins the orange prize which is now the women's prize for fiction uh you're like a 30 one of 535 or whatever it is you know you're making a lot of lists you're the bell of the bull and you're still, you're still a kid basically. And I mean, I guess we'll start there. That's a head spinning state of affairs to find yourself in. How did you process it at the time? Like, did you have a, I, I don't, I can't imagine you wouldn't have had a sense of how unusual it was. Maybe you sort of knew it, but it, that's just your life. You, I mean, you were almost too young to have perspective. <laughs> I think I was, and thank God I was, because I think if I had been a little bit older, I would have been so much more afraid of of everything. You know what I mean? Like in the in the moment, two things happened. One was I think I dissociated a lot, and I was just like, "This is this crazy this is happening to her. Isn't that nice?" Like you know, <laughs> like <laughs> it, it was really. It, I really felt that way. I, I I felt like it was happening to the book and sort of to some entity, like some faceless entity that was like carrying the book under her arm. And I was just sort of there to be like, huh, check her out. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and, and I think, thank God for that because, because it, it was life changing and, and the, so many of the best things that exist in my life now came to me as a result of that. I, I, and I, and it was, a, and I think, it was a book that was so, it was also deeply emotionally necessary for me to write. So I'm, I, now that I look back on the book, you know, I, I, on the tiger's wife there, are, I am not that writer anymore. You know, I, I, I have been given the opportunity kind of through the success of the tiger's wife itself to evolve as a writer and to, you know, to write a Western and like write this, you know, like, and, and write two and a half books in between that went nowhere, you know, and, and, and I'm, I feel very fortunate that that came to pass that way because I, I do think that I could have just as easily been, and I was for a very long time, like very, very overwhelmed by what had happened with the tiger's wife, but that dissociation played an important role in my ability to be like, well, that happened to some, somebody else. Now you write this next book, like whoever you are now, you must write this next book. And I think that that, you know, and then it still took me eight years to write it. And I was just like throwing pages and pages into the trash and, and, you know, being like, I'll never write again. And like, but you know, like I, I'm kind of shocked that I'm at my, it, at the darkest moments post Tiger's Wife, I I would not have said to you with any confidence, like, and there'll be a third book too, you know, like I'll be able to write a third book. <laughs> like, um... Well, but that's what I want to ask you about because I think people read your bio or read the Tiger's Wife and like flip the book over and it's like, you know, she's 25 <laughs> she won the orange, and they're just like, what? Like, you know, especially people who are writerly, like would just be like, oh my God, like, this is a prodigy. Like she's got the magic touch and life has like blessed her and all this stuff. And th some of that's true. You know, you very gifted and uh, it's very unusual for somebody to be that accomplished at that age in this profession. 
but, but lucky too but, but lucky as well like, yeah it takes a little bit of that too right yeah and i think there's a proper humility in acknowledging that i'm glad to hear you say that because i always bristle when people are like i don't believe in luck i'm like well <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's the full, I mean, I don't think luck is, it always takes hard work and skill and, you know, all of it, but you got to get a little lucky too. Can you point to ways in which you got lucky with the tiger's wife? I mean, just the, the fact that the, 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 let's say the time it was written in, you know, like the, um, it was written, I was writing it in 2008, 2009. I could have written it in 2007 and like it could have you know it could have come out in 2008 during the crash you know when nobody was buying fiction like like and i don't mean like publishers weren't buying fiction i mean like people weren't buying fiction because they didn't have money to buy food you know like right. like or pay their mortgages um leisure you know it came out at a time when leisure was something that was coming back into people's lives and like the escapism of fiction Right now, it could have come out right now. Where, you know, people are reading a lot less fiction right now. It 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 it, it came out post crash, but pre smartphones. You know, the the fiction landscape, the way we consume books now is very different. There's a lot of free content that that, that books are competing with. Right. Um, it came out at a time when the country was unified, when when you know uh, people weren't so politically divided. I mean, they were still politically divided, but they weren't so politically divided where, where, you know, uh, uh, where a, um, a recommendation for a book that somebody loved, you didn't immediately ask like, well, what are their politics? Like, if like, look, what does it mean about them? If they, like, if they love that book, what does it mean about the book? You know, like, like these are things that, that emerging writers right now are, are contending with. I see it in my students all the time. The, many of them are brilliant. They should be breakout stars right now. They're not. It's, it's just a different, you know, like we could start with that. <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, timing, is, timing matters hugely. I think when a book takes off and really finds a readership, I think there's almost something kind of magical and mystical about a book meeting its moment, its yeah. culture, its cultural moment in just the right way with just the right resonance. Yeah. It speaks to the, I mean, it's gotta be good. Yeah. It's gotta be well executed on the page, but the, the public has to be kind of ready for it. And there's a confluence of factors that determine that. And you can't game that as a writer. Um, totally. So, so the thing I want to ask you about is the is the, the kind of books that followed, the failed books that followed The Tiger's Wife, mm -hmm. where you, you wrote, what, a thousand pages that didn't amount to a published novel. Uh, like for somebody who had so much success right out of the gates, to then struggle so much to find the next book like how did you process that with great difficulty i mean i think it was divided into sort of thirds where i was trying to i was trying to find the right material i thought that i thought i didn't realize so young when the tiger's wife came out that i didn't realize that that the process of writing and the process of publishing are not the same thing and the fact that i had published a book didn't mean that everything i wrote thenceforth would be for public consumption would be sort of part of this career that it was okay to make mistakes in private and that was an agonizing journey um but the moment it gelled was the moment that i found the book that became inland and then there are still elements of those lost years or those lost pages that ended up in the morning side. So it's yeah. not all for naught. Sometimes the, no. the process is messy and it's unpredictable and it's not linear. And um, uh, I, I think that you're to be congratulated for seeing it through. And I think everybody I talk to on this show has done that in some way, shape or form. And it's just a, a great thrill to get to talk to you. It's just great to get to talk to you and to catch you as this third book is coming out into the world. And I wish you well with it. And I wish you well with all that you have going. Thank you so much. This was such a gratifying and wonderful conversation. I really appreciate you.